That way is where Hospital West used to sit. Unfortunately, that one burns down in 1818. Uh, prior to that, though, it was the largest of the three buildings. It held about 24 patients. It had a laundry, a kitchen, an outdoor surgical veranda, which sounds a bit strange by today's standards, <laughs> outdoor surgery. Uh, today, of course, we have indoor electric lighting, but back then, indoor light sources were things like whale oil, oil lamps, candles. And so what they preferred to do was to utilize natural sunlight, weather permitting, and perform those surgeries where they could see. Probably a wise choice. Uh, going out that way is where our apothecary lived. I will point that building out to you at the end of the tour. But where we are currently is where Hospital East would have been originally. And Hospital East was the convalescence for those soldiers heading in from surgery across the way. Now it is a military hospital. The rooms are reflective of that. The room that we're in right now would have been for our officers. The next room over enlisted men. Room after that at the time was the isolation ward. The room that we're in right now, this would have held originally about six to eight beds. And you can see we do have the three that are here today. The exception is going to be this bed at the end there. Now that one would have been in the isolation ward. It is an invalid's bed. And you'll notice there's a hole cut in the middle there that leads to a chamber pot beneath bed. Now that's going to be bed for a soldier much too weak, sick, incapacitated to get up, use the outdoor facilities, or do too much of anything else. So what he has is easy access to that bedpan below, well, chamber pot below. And I do sort of compare it to the bedpan of its time, although I've talked to some nurses who do say that might be a little handier today than, than it would, uh, the bedpans are. Um, I joke we need to bring it back, but I don't know how comfortable that would be. But that is just for your soldier who's not able to get up and in, do anything for himself, basically. Now I should mention that this period, the Spanish are very advanced medically. In fact, from 1563 onward, Spanish physicians are required to be licensed. In order to do that, they did have to undergo 10 years of university medical training, as well as ongoing competency hearings every four to five years just to make sure they're retaining that knowledge. That's not required here in the United States until much later. It wasn't federally mandated for all physicians to be licensed until 1910. So that does mean up until that point, at least in certain areas, anyone could hang up a sign advertising that they're a physician and start performing surgeries, no formal education required. Which is a little terrifying when you think about it today, but uh, luckily for us, licensing is a place we are in good hands. And the Spanish were as well. That's not just because of the licensing, although I'm sure that helped immensely. The Spanish just happened to be very, very sanitary in their practices, very clean. Uh, that comes because they are very influenced by the Moors. Now the Moors ruled over Spain for nearly 700 years, but very medically advanced themselves in that time. They were preserving ancient Greek and Egyptian medical texts. They were building large cities with universities, medical universities among those. They are also washing several times a day. Now in their case, it's a cultural practice. They're washing for religious reasons. They're washing because they view illness as an unclean thing. Washing is done with water and vinegar, something they get from the Egyptians. Uh, today we know acetic acid in vinegar kills germs. Even after the Moors were driven from Spain, the Spanish took what they learned from them and continued to apply that to their practices. So at a hospital like this one, they would have been washing their hands and instruments several times during surgery with water and vinegar. Cleanliness goes a long way, especially back then, and it really does give a Spanish hospital like this one in the colonies an edge. We would have had a pretty high survival rate here of about 70 to 75 percent, which isn't too shabby when you consider other colonial hospitals of that time, only about half of that at 30 to 35 percent. So not doing too badly here, and it does help the survival rate that it is a peacetime hospital. So there's no warfare, there's no mass casualties, no fighting, nothing like that's going on in the years this hospital's in operation. It's a military hospital though, so accidents can befall the soldiers, and we do want to make sure that they are taken care of just in case a threat presents itself. We need them ready to protect the colony. And what I'm going to talk about with you all this afternoon are just a few of the more life-saving surgeries and procedures of the time. Unfortunately, one of the more common of those was amputation. So I am going to talk a bit about that. I promise I'm not explicitly descriptive or anything, but I do go into a little detail. So if you need me to stop, just let me know. I'm sure we'll be fine. Uh, let's say that we have a soldier. What he's doing is running a drill at the Castillo here in town, the fort. He's moving one of those cases that the cannon sit on, but while he's doing this, his hands caught beneath it, wheel rolls over it. It crushes the bones in his hand through his arm. They can set simple fractures at that time, but that's about it. You can't put together shattered bones, nor can you fix compound fractures. 
not only would this be a constant source of pain, but infection is bound to set in. There's not very much they can do to stop the spread of infection besides amputation. So that's going to be a last resort, but to save his life, that's what they're going to opt to do. They're going to bring him to that outdoor surgical veranda I mentioned. They'd set him down, and the apothecary is going to come. He's going to bring him a tincture to drink, which will calm his anxieties before and during that surgery. Unfortunately for our soldiers, no anesthesia yet. Not until 1846 with ether, a good 25 years after we've closed. So while there's the potential he could be awake, I'll tell you now, uh, the tincture we're giving him, at the least, will put him in a very sedate, almost euphoric state. And when we move on to the apothecary in just a bit, we'll talk more about what that was made out of. But at least know he's not going into surgery fully aware of what's happening to him. We're gonna give him that tincture. A couple of orderlies would hold him in place in case of movement. We're going to get started. And the first thing that they would have used was this right here, the petite screw tourniquet. Now that's invented in the early 1700s by a French physician, Jean-Louis Petit. It really revolutionized surgery. They're going to affix that over the affected area about four fingers away from where the incision would be made. They pull that strap as tight as they could, and then you're turning the screw at the top to its tightest point. So it's cutting off circulation, it's compressing the area. No matter how much you might have struggled, it's not going to go anywhere. With circulation cut off, we are going to start with the actual cutting. They're using this right here. It's a uh, capital knife or an amputation knife. Now the function of this is to separate soft tissue from the bone. They're performing something called a single flap incision. So what they're going to do is start here, go around at an angle, and meet that beginning point. That's done very, very quickly in a circular motion. Trouble now is you've got excess soft tissue that's still going to need later, what they're going to do is pull that up and away, and the orderly would hand them a leather strap just to hold that in place with. With that out of the way, we're using another knife, and this is called a Catlin knife or a Catlin blade. Now you'll see with this one, it would have been sharp on all sides. This was used to cut away the uh, interosseous ligament between the two front bones of the arm. Those can be tense, stringy, you don't want those getting caught in the serrated edges of the bone saw. And I do have some good news involving the bone saw, but it's as good as it can be in this situation. The good news is the fact our surgeon's also very skilled. He's going to take great care as he does this. There's quite a bit of tension between those two front bones and the arm. Understandably, you don't want those to crack or splinter. If he's a very skilled surgeon, he's going to take great care, but he's going to be pretty quick about the whole ordeal. On average, for a skilled surgeon, it's only about 30 to 60 seconds before that arm was severed. And once the arm is off, we're going to give that to the chaplain who's on site. He's going to bless the arm. He's going to take it to be buried on consecrated ground. Now the Spanish, very Italian Catholic, you okay so far? <laughs> Just let me know if you need anything. Okay. okay. The Spanish are very devoutly Catholic and they hold all body parts with great respect. So arms, legs, even fingers and toes were blessed and buried on consecrated ground. And that's done because they have a belief at the time if you died and your entire body wasn't buried on consecrated ground, let's say you had an amputation in life, you may not reunite with that to live in the afterlife. Understandably, they do not want that happening. So they tried very hard to meet the spiritual needs of the soldiers as well as the physical, very important to them. So arm is off, the bleeding does still need to be controlled. And that is where this came in. And when this is called zootinaculum, and as you'll see, that is small and hook-like with that point at the end. Now, what they're doing with this, and I get a little graphic here, so I apologize in advance, they're having to go down into the stump, and they're drawing the arteries to the surface, tying those closed with a strong silk ligature, so it's controlling blood flow and pressure. You do still have smaller veins and vessels in the arm, not quite as much pressure with those, and in that case, they're using a cautery iron that's been preheated until it's red hot, they're going to cauterize those smaller veins and vessels closed. And so now bleeding is controlled. They remove the tourniquet, not the leather strap. First, what they're doing is applying something to that surgical site known as a lint mixture. And a lint mixture is a bit like a hemostatic that would be today. It was made up of grounded flour, grounded cotton. They're going to pack that very liberally to the surgical site. What it did was help promote healthy drainage for the area. It also coagulated the arteries. Eventually what happens there is the soldier's body absorbs that ground of flour and cotton and breaks it down. So they apply that, they remove the leather strap, reapproximate the soft tissue over the stump, and we're just gonna close that up. But they're not using sutures, which I know sounds strange by today's standards as well. They do have suturing at this period, but it came down to being more of a preference, and a lot of colonial surgeons, particularly the Spanish, dislike it. You had a 
higher rate of infection setting in afterwards. So an alternative, many of them were using basically adhesive strips. And those were made with strips of silk or linen and something called isinglass. What that was was the purified air bladder of a fish, usually fish like sturgeon. What you got from that was a very sticky, almost jelly-like glue substance that when you pair with strips of silk or linen, you basically have the butterfly band-aid of its time in a sense. So they're going to seal up the stump with the eyes and glass adhesive. They follow that up with nice, fresh, clean linen wrap. They're going to bandage him tightly. They're going to give the soldier a sling. They're going to give him a bed to rest in. It was common practice to keep a soldier here as long as they thought was necessary until he had recovered from that injury. Now, how long that may have taken, it does vary with each patient. So really, the best estimation I might be able to give you is that it would take longer for one patient to recover over another. Surgery itself did not take very much time at all. For an army amputation, from start to finish, it only took about two to three minutes. For a leg amputation, closer to four to six minutes. Um, they're moving quickly. There is a good chance the patient can go into shock from the pain. They don't really have any treating that, so really they're just moving as fast as they possibly can. So in a nutshell, that's an army amputation at the colonial era. Everybody's okay so far, right? Are these replicas or are these? Um, well, we have on the table for the most part, except for our little blood lights that Kate will point out at the end, are replicas. That's just because we don't want to hurt the tools themselves. We also don't want to hurt ourselves. Uh, you may see the capital knife, the doctor's office, still very sharp, so you went into that. So these four demonstration purposes are replicas, but they are based off of several models of that time period, so you get a good idea. Any other questions, guys? Okay, everyone's good, right? Okay, great, because I'm about to talk about another method of amputation. Um, I mentioned fingers and toes also being buried on consecrated ground, so of course that stands to reason digital amputations were taking place. Those can be done in a very similar fashion. Again, though, it's about preference, and there's an alternative method of amputation at this period, still around today, known as the uh, guillotine method of amputation, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, while it could be done with limbs, they did prefer it with digital amputation. So you have a soldier coming in, you cut his finger badly, it is showing signs of infection. What they would do is have him come in, he'd probably get a lesser dose of that tincture, he's going to place his finger down on a steel anvil like this one, and then what we're using is one of these, and what this is is an osteotone, uh, as you'll see. It is a curved chisel, so I'm sure you know where this is headed, unfortunately. Uh, what they're going to have to do is place that at the joint of the finger. And in this case, there is more of a chance he's awake than with the arm amputation. So we're going to give him a distraction beforehand, so I don't know. Hey, look over there. I'm sure it was better than that. Don't worry. Uh, once he was sufficiently distracted in some way, what they're going to do is give that two to three solid blows. Fingers should come off. It's going to be cauterized, or they may use the lint mixture icing glass piece of method. They're going to bandage him up. They're actually just going to send him right on his way. That one was considered an outpatient procedure by today's standards. So he could go home afterwards, back to the barracks, or sometimes we joke he may go to the tavern and self-medicate afterwards. Alcohol is blood thinner. As Spanish are aware of this, you're not going to have that prior to a surgery or during it. But with afterwards, with something like that. Let's just say the chaplains weren't terribly far away from where the hospital was at the time, so real possibility. I'm going to talk about uh, one more surgery with you all today, and then I'm going to mention bloodletting just because I find that interesting. But the last surgery I'm going to talk about uh, was probably one of the more common pr procedures of the period. Uh, not quite medical, it, it is, but we're going more to the dentistry field now than we are with medicine. Um, dentistry in this time. Not quite what it is today. I want to say it's in its infancy in some ways, but not, not exactly. You do have proper dentists, but they're not in a little garrison town like St. Augustine. They're in bigger cities. What you're going to have here is probably your surgeon or your physician fulfilling that role. As far as the procedures being performed at that period, uh, fillings have been done for a very long time. And in theory, if your soldier had a cavity, he could get a filling. The problem there is often those are very expensive. Those were done with gold or silver, may not be within the budget. As far as tooth care goes in general, they are taking care of their teeth like you ride when they're brushing them, but they don't have toothpaste, what they have are tooth powders, which were made with very abrasive materials like charcoal. So when they were brushing them, they were really scrubbing, it took the enamel off, it was not great in the long run. So while they're trying to take care of their teeth, you still have a lot of problems. And if you've got a soldier with a bad tooth causing pain, causing discomfort, what do you think the best, simplest method is going to be to relieve itself of that? We are going to pull out that tooth. Uh, before I demonstrate that, I've got a couple of fun facts. The first one's actually not fun, but it is the fact we don't have Novocaine. 
what they do have is clove oil. Clove oil is a natural analgesic that's still used in dentistry to a lesser extent today. And if they say if you have a toothache, if you apply clove, clove oil, excuse me, clove oil to the gum line, it will help numb the pain for a bit. So it's something to take the edge off. Uh, he may have gotten some of that tincture as well. Fun fact number two is just the fact that if you were a soldier, you had to have at least four teeth. That's a very small amount of teeth to have, but it's specific teeth. You had to have two sets of opposing teeth on the side of the mouth. This is because they had powder packs to bite open in order to kill their muskets with gunpowder. As long as he's got those four, he's good to go, and the fact he's going to keep his job. Now, as far as the extraction goes, what they're going to use first is this right here. It's called a tooth key. You'll see that's got a pretty large opening, which would have been adjustable depending on the tooth. They're going to put it around the tooth like so. Um, I don't have a whole lot of pressure on here, but it's in there tightly. They're going to whittle that just a bit till the tooth is loose, give it a good pull. Hopefully, the tooth will just come out in one pull. Uh, if there's decay, though, there's a good chance it can break off in the gum line. That is where this comes in. It's called a goat foot elevator. They call it that because that, they thought that's what it resembled with the foot and the tuft of hair. Yeah, most people do think it looks like a medieval torture device or something, is what I hear. But what you're going to do is go down into the gum line and elevate fragments of tooth and root to the surface. Now, at that point, those can be reached with the dental forceps. And from there, you're just going to pull out the remaining fragments of tooth and root. It was important that all those fragments were removed. Otherwise, you have infection, septicemia, especially setting in. At this period, at least behind epidemics, infections really were a major cause of death. So if that's something they can prevent from happening, then that's all the better for everyone. Any questions about anything so far? No? I'm going to talk about blood lead really quick just because I think it's interesting. Uh, this is, you know, most people when I mention blood money, of course, that's the idea you want to purge the body of blood in some way. Uh, often it was because of that four humors the body theory. You may have seen the little um, sheep were up front. They didn't really know how blood worked. If you were feverish, they thought you had a high fever. That was too much blood in your body. They'd want to take out more to get you in balance. Um, really, it was a cure-all at this point. I was reading something in some of our records where it talked about having uh, weakness from bloodlust. They might try to do a bloodletting to get you back in balance, which makes no sense, but they, just, they thought it worked. Um, leaching is what most people think of when you say bloodletting. At this period in St. Augustine, they're not really using leeches. What they are using is a little lancet like this one. And this is going to be for your blood letter on the go. Uh, they tie a tourniquet around the arm, and they make an incision on that upper vein going horizontally, bleed you out as much as they thought was necessary until you were back in balance. Didn't always work terribly well because they didn't realize we have all, so many pints of blood in the body, and um, it did cause a few deaths, well, several, a few notable ones, uh, which include George Washington, uh, Mozart, and Ada Lovelace, who all died as a, as a side effect of bloodletting. So it, they, it had, they thought it worked, it's just today we, we know better, so. But I think it's interesting, so that's why I talk about it. Used for far too long. If you would like to, once again, you're more than welcome to uh, take a look at the tools. You're welcome to take photos. I just ask you don't touch, they're a little sharp. I don't mind getting hurt. Do let me know if there's any questions. When you're ready, we're gonna move into that next room, and I promise it's much less gruesome. It's just apothecary medicine. So take a look around, when you're ready, let me know. We'll move forward.